Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about behavioral health issues among military families. Joining us in our panel today are Catherine Power, Director, Center for Mental Health Services, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. Captain Joan Hunter, Director of Psychological Health, U.S. Public Health Service, detailed with the National Guard Bureau, Arlington, Virginia. Hector Sayas, Recovery Coach and Consultant, Orlando, Florida. Dr. Bradley Carlin, National Mental Health Director for Psychotherapy and Psychogeriatrics, Office of Mental Health Services, Department of Veterans Affairs Headquarters, Washington, D.C. Catherine, more than two million troops deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq. What are some of the behavioral health issues uh, related uh, to the returning vets that are there, the vets that are there and the returning vets? I think all of us are paying great attention to the behavioral health issues of anyone who has been in combat. And first of all, when we use the term behavioral health, we generally are talking about a broad range of mental and emotional and substance abuse disorders and or problems. We know that anyone who has been in combat will probably suffer from trauma and anyone who's been in a combat situation will have effects of that trauma. So the first thing we really want to pay attention to is how have the individuals who have served in combat uh, absorbed that trauma and become resilient to that trauma. In addition, we're seeing a variety of behavioral adjustments having to do with post-traumatic stress, having to do with depression, having to do with suicide ideation, and of course the reintegration issues when people come back from combat and move back into their families and try to sustain some normality of family life, we see behavioral issues going on within the families. So there's a host of issues that are happening for these individuals. And Dr. Carlin, exactly what types of symptoms are associated with some of these disorders? Let's take PTSD for example. So with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, there are certain clusters of symptoms that we typically see. Um, including what we first call avoidance symptoms. So individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder may avoid places or circumstances that may remind them of the traumatic event that they experienced during wartime or other situations that might have been the precursor, if you will, to the post-traumatic stress disorder. Individuals with PTSD also often experience uh, numbing symptoms, if you will, to block the pain associated with the post-traumatic stress disorder. And so sometimes individuals will engage in certain behaviors to block that numbing. They'll uh, not confront the emotional experiences that they might have, try to stuff it down. Sometimes alcohol or substance use is a way to try to block those uh, emotional pain symptoms. And another common type of symptom that individuals experience with PTSD is hypervigilance symptoms. Um, where individuals might be sometimes easily startled, for example, especially in circumstances that might serve as a reminder to, uh, of the traumatic event. And, and lastly, I should mention that individuals often also experience what are known as re-experiencing symptoms. Re-experiencing symptoms uh, can include nightmares, intrusive thoughts, that are essentially flashbacks, if you will, to that traumatic event that precipitated uh, the PTSD. And so one of the things that, that I want to say is, is it's just not the person that is on active military, but there's also the vets, there's National Guard, there's reserves. So we're talking about a whole host and spectrum of categories within the military of, of men and women that are affected, correct? I think it's very important, Yvette, that we stress that the populations that we really are concerned about is that whole gamut, as you've indicated. It is individuals who have served on active duty and may still be on active duty. It is individuals who are in the National Guard, who are a special group of people who actually belong to a state militia. We have individuals who have served in reserve components of each of the individual services who may or may not be in active status. And then we have a whole host of the family members who come 
um, in, into relationships and have relationships with those individuals who may be attached to an active duty military base, who may not have any connection, and then we have veterans. And we have veterans who are dispersed all across the United mm -hmm. States and may or may not have access to VA services. So it is a very important definitional right. issue. And Captain Hunter, let's talk a little bit. Catherine just mentioned the families. Uh, how does the family then uh, approach an individual who may have a problem? What are some of the issues that they need to be aware of? My experience in the National Guard has been that it's PTSD and mild traumatic brain injuries affect the whole family. One person may be the person who has the disorder or the stress symptoms, but it, re, it brim, goes throughout the whole family. You can't not address PTSD without affecting the whole family in that, so to speak, the work that you do in taking care of someone with PTSD, the family benefits from that. We see that in the National Guard all the time, and we see family programs that are dedicated specifically to deal with service members who have PTSD, mild traumatic brain injuries, but a whole host of other reintegration issues, especially now in the National Guard, we're seeing a population who's never deployed, who's experiencing stress and stress-related concerns. Hector, let's, let's get an idea. You, you were a, a military, you served in the military, and now you're working with some of the individuals that are experiencing some of these um, behavioral health issues. You want to talk a little bit about your own experience? Sure. I spent uh, quite an extensive amount of time in the military and uh, recently uh, discharged last year. And uh, I've made it a commitment, being long-term recovery myself, made it a commitment to go ahead and reach out to these folks that are suffering from... Uh, from these issues uh, that are relying on substance use as an escape mechanism, if you will, from and and, and obviously that is a wrong, uh, the wrong path to take, if you will. So I, I try to help them out. Were you involved while you were in the military, and how did it happen? I was in uh, in uh, full blown alcoholism while I was in the military, and um, had extensive, obviously, experience and treatment through that, and uh, it got to a point where. Now my time is to pay back by giving back to that community, especially military and veterans that we have discussed across the board. And um, I just don't want anybody to experience what I had. And uh, that was a personal collapse. So I take great pride and honor in helping those to keep them, to, to, to let them know that there are things to actually do about it and uh, not have a fear-based um, type of attitude at all times to go ahead and pursue help at all costs. I was just going to mention, Hector, that one of the things that we've discovered in talking with uh, various members of the military that peer support services seem to be uh, an area that uh, is getting more and more attention about the fact that they're very effective. I know the VA uses some peer support services. And what is your experience in terms of why, why is the value of peer support services so important? The most important part in there is because uh, being a veteran, you can understand another veteran because you've been there. You've gone through these things as well, the uh, operations, uh, deployment tempos, and that sort of thing, the operational uh, picture of everything. You've been there, done that, so to speak, as we always know. So by providing myself and making myself available to veteran organizations, anybody who deals with veterans, either active or reserve, or uh, having, you know, um, under the VA system, then, uh, then that helps out. Uh, it just supplements the help that they're already getting, you know, through treatment and so forth, to go ahead and relate, to bring that component of compassion and understanding. Let them know that there's something we can do, there's hope. I wanna go so. back and talk about a little bit on, on the issue of homelessness. Now, we see uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, we see alcoholism, we see other substance use disorders, and then you also see depression and other uh, mental health problems. Um, Dr. Carlin, how uh, acute is the issue of homelessness within the military? So certainly among veterans, there is a sizable homeless population. And this has actually been a, a priority of the Department of Veterans Affairs to reduce homelessness. In fact, um, Secretary Shinseki has declared that VA will eliminate homeless or end homelessness. And so there has been a five-year plan in place to end homelessness among veterans, which includes a, a comprehensive constellation of programs and services 
for individuals that are homeless. To address homelessness, though, it's not just a matter, of course, of providing housing. That is one important aspect to make sure that individuals are in comfortable, secure surroundings. But it's also critical to address the mental health problems that a lot of homeless individuals have, as you noted. And so we have in VA a variety of programs that address both aspects and, and oftentimes very much together where we have residential treatment programs that specialize in providing individuals with that secure and, and safe surrounding while they're initially receiving intensive care that they may need. And then following that, there is a range of additional services for homeless individuals uh, so that they can get their lives back. And that doesn't only include shelter and emotional health, it's an important part, but also work. And so there are a number of employment related programs within VA to support them getting back to work. And I want to um, continue, when we come back, I want to continue on the topic of homelessness because I really want to get to the issue of when the vet comes back, I mean, how does the family, there are issues, you know, we talked a lot about the family a little bit already, but I want to see that intersect of what can a family member do to, uh, you know, prevent uh, uh, a vet from, or, or a member of the military from, from becoming homeless. We'll be right back. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a, is a clear issue for a lot of people, especially deployed troops, coming home. And when they come home, they come home to communities and to families that are going to experience uh, the, the effects of that. And uh, there's pretty good evidence that people with um, post-traumatic stress, whether it's from a military interaction or from some other traumatic event, have um, more difficulty with mental illness, with uh, depression, anxiety, with uh, substance use, with having difficulties with family relationships, with just interactions in their community. So we know that we can prevent some of that if we acknowledge it and deal with it ahead of time and before it begins to manifest. SAMHSA's uh, efforts, because uh, we address essentially what we call the civilian aspect of it. The Department of uh, Defense and the Veterans Administration are responsible for the major components. But we find that uh, military families uh, often are not eligible for VA services or that military members themselves don't present to uh, military uh, services, so they show up in the civilian uh, community. So we're trying to educate community practitioners about post-traumatic stress disorder. We're trying to partner with the VA and the Department of Defense so that the safety net is created so we can address issues like suicide. In fact, we have a partnership with the VA with a suicide hotline so that uh, an individual who is on active duty or uh, is eligible for VA services can call that hotline and they will be referred to the VA so that we keep that safety net intact. In, in and if the uh, person who's a veteran or active duty member or his or her family presents to a community-based organization, they too are trying to make sure that they ask about uh, whether you are in the military or you have a loved one in the military and it's affecting you so that uh, we can address those issues. Well, I will equal, equally encourage uh, spouses and family members to be able to come forth. There are programs there as well that listen to them. Their, their presence in the family and their relation to a f uh, military member is equally important to the armed services, and they, they are never forgotten. They need to also know at all times that they can come forth and through family advocacy programs, chaplains, any kind of counseling or any kind of help that they need. Even some of the individual units have uh, um, uh, members and spouse, spouse uh, groups that get together, the ombuds program in the Navy in particular is very important. Uh, so there are sources for them to reach out and, and, and say and, and let them know that they do need help. The help is there if they, if they, if they ask. Catherine, let's continue on the thought of homelessness. And, and when a member returns, what can the family do to really support that member and to be vigilant about some of the signs? 
Well, I think when Dr. Carlin was mentioning the VA's efforts in homelessness, um, I was reminded that the VA has really um, developed a program that is new in many ways for the VA that's picking up some of the strategies and some of the outreach and some of the connection of uh, some of the programs that the Department of Health and Human Services and HUD have used for several years. And it's wonderful that we really actually have now a partnership now between the Department of Veterans Affairs and HHS and, and the Housing and Urban Development. And one of those engagement strategies is trying to make sure that there is outreach to the individual military family member and their family member in some ways to make sure that they are employed, as Dr. Carlin indicated, and that they have the kind of support services around them that they need. Many of the family members don't really know what to do. In other words, someone comes back into the house, uh, they feel um, everyone's, you know, maybe angry, you know, there's a lot of adjustment going through, they're not quite sure how to approach the discussion. What happens is that they may have some financial problems, they may not be able to get a job. So there, all of these homelessness programs, as Dr. Carlin indicated, are looking at not only housing issues, but also supported employment opportunities and also family support opportunities. And so we recommend that if family members need that kind of support, that they look into some of the local homelessness service providers, as well as what the VA has available and make sure that they seek those local services so that the individual is supported and housed and employed so that helps create more stability in the family. And within VA to facilitate this process, VA has recently established a national center for homelessness among veterans. And as part of that center, there's an 800 number that individuals can call, individuals who might be homeless, at risk for homelessness, family members may call this, and immediately get connected to a counselor that can help them to chart the right path for that individual. This is important for the National Guard, but there's another population in the National Guard that I think needs to be highlighted here, and that is not all of the National Guard are considered veterans, so they may not be able to participate in some of the VA programs. That's why our relationship with SAMHSA and Catherine's group, the memorandum of understanding that we have between the National Guard and SAMHSA, is so important because it connects with the community and the communities through SAMHSA and our relationship, that's where the National Guard is. It's the governor in the state, and it's the militias, as Catherine mentioned. So a vast majority of the folks that we're seeing in the psychological health program, they've never been deployed. So it's very important for us to look at community resources, as mm -hmm. Catherine mentioned. Absolutely. And Hector, you're in the thick of it in the community. Take us through a cycle of some of the folks that you counsel and that you work with. The, the most important part, when we think about these veterans and when it comes to homelessness, for me, the key is how do we get the information to them? It's hard for them to, you know, get to a phone or seek because the level of the hopelessness, it is just completely, you know, eroded. So. I try to get to them in a way that they will go ahead and seek and lead them to the local uh, VA facility. Now, some VA facilities uh, in local places, they may not have a facility to take these people. I mean, this is what they talk about at certain times. We don't have a place nearby and transportation. A lot of factors that fall into this. And what I try to do is is get involved in the level that they don't get you know, left by the wayside because the 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 assets are there the, the the programs are there but we need to get them involved and bring them forth so they can go ahead and have access to all these so what i'm hearing is that veterans affairs and and other services associated with the military has some programs, but also that everyone can avail other programams, correct, and Catherine? I, I, absolutely, Vet. And I think one of the most important things that I think we represent here today in talking with you about this issue is that we are beginning to see that the military civilian relationship has to change. Mm -hmm. And it is significant that it is changing, and it is significant that the Department of Defense, the Department of Veteran Affairs are no longer closed systems. And in fact, those systems have 
I think, appropriately acknowledged that there may be people in the community and we need to work together to make sure that we are reaching out together with communities and that means talking to the civilian population and the civilian providers and the civilians have to feel the same way that they can have conversations with the military treatment facility providers with the VA and that whole dialogue I think is emblematic of a new way of thinking and I think it's extremely important and very very favorable for the behavioral health world to understand that. And Dr. Carlin let's talk about utopia people would have memorandums of understanding, they work together, but in reality, if that system wasn't yet perfected, do, they, do families need to know they need to be persistent? Family members are so key to everything we're talking about because oftentimes it's the family member that is the first and sometimes the only individual to begin to identify that something's wrong. And so family members, in, in so many cases, I, I, I think, are the um, unrecognized assets, if you will, in terms of getting the treatment that individuals may need to those individuals. So it is critical that um, professionals within the Department of Veterans Affairs, within SAMHSA and other agencies are engaging with family members to provide the education, to provide the information that those family members might need to first identify that there is a problem and then to know what to do. What do you do when you notice that your family member has a problem? And it's critical that these partnerships that Catherine talked about are available between agencies and with communities so that we can interface with family members, we can make those connections to ensure that family members are empowered with the information they need and with information about how to engage resources so that help can be received both for the for the individual and for the family members. And Catherine with the new health care reform legislation I suspect that <coughs> there are going to be some changes to facilitate more access? Well I think the health care reform uh, law is certainly going to have an impact at the community and local uh, state and state level because the um, the law basically encourages uh, an increase in the number of people who will become available for insurance and so we're predicting that there will be a 13 million more people uh, that will be coming under uh, and eligible for Medicaid so that those individuals will probably have some behavioral health uh, issues and approximately a third of those individuals will probably have uh, serious mental illness or substance abuse disorders so under the state exchanges and under the way in which the community providers will work we think there will be some significant changes and we also again continue to to look at the fact that um, that as these facilities the Department of Defense uh, has to depend more and more on community-based agencies for their delivery service because they're not necessarily investing in active duty military treatment facilities but working through their TRICARE contracts and so that means the TRICARE has to go into the community and have relationships with those community providers that's all continuing to move Yvette and shift dramatically as each state then has to make its own health exchange and health insurance plan. So yes, you're correct, it is dramatic. Well, when we come back, I wanna continue on the thought of the cost to society of not meeting the needs of all of these individuals, as well as some of the programs that are available to uh, have families continue to access uh, treatment. We'll be right back. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. I had no idea it was going to be so hard. I didn't know what to expect. You hear the stories, but I never took any of it seriously until I found myself here. And then I realized I was going to have to work hard for my recovery. If you or someone you know has a drug or alcohol problem, you are not alone. Call 1-800-662-HELP. Recovery was the hardest job I ever had and the most important. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.
The mission of Grace After Fire is women veterans reaching out to other women veterans and supporting those women veterans. Focus on Grace, but yet, oh, by the way, I have A quarter of a million women have served in both Iraq and Afghanistan. That's a large population of women who now have seen combat, but to think you're going to go over to places like Iraq, Afghanistan, and now Libya and come back and be the same person is not realistic. We're here to make sure that that woman veteran knows how to get to the VA, how to find a professional who can help her with whatever issues she has, whether it's needing counseling or therapy or, or to take care of her you know, physical ailments. We're an organization made up of female veterans. We understand what they're going through, what they've been through, and who better to help you than that type of organization. The way we provide assistance to women veterans is foremost is ourselves. So as women veterans, we're connecting with the other female veteran and trying to help them figure out which, which is the best approach to solve their problem. And then when you pick up the phone, if you've been to Afghanistan, I've got somebody who's been to Afghanistan. You want to talk about Iraq? I got three Iraqi veterans. You want to talk about the Vietnam era? I got one of those. You want to talk about Desert Storm? I got a gal who's got done that. A couple of us were at Kosovo. We actually have online support that's available 24-7. Anyone can become a friend or family member of Grace. You do not have to be the veteran. It's an on anonymous registration so that you are able to blog. There are some phenomenal, fascinating, heart-wrenching stories that have been posted on our, on our website where women are for the first time feeling safe to talk about something that happened to them years ago. We don't know where they live, we don't know what their name is, but we can give them the answers to hopefully, you know, find the path that they're looking for. Because we all served in the military in, in different capacities, we do have a sense of sisterhood and because we have that sisterhood, when we approach or a veteran approaches us who needs assistance, they can feel that. These individuals need to be treated because some of the, the lasting effects that come from this, if it just festers and does go untreated, is we have had an increase in the suicide rate. And so we need to try to reach in and intervene before it gets to that stage. As the veteran comes back in, if they can get involved in their community and do something tangible. His and her recovery will be a whole lot quicker. So one of the things Grace After Fire is doing, right now it's with my staff, it is my staff that's doing the build in a Habitat for Humanity has. One, two, three. It is an all-women build. It was all funded by women raising money, and it is a woman that is receiving this house. Grace After Fire has been a great organization to partner with. Um, they refer women veterans to my organization with Operation Healthy Reunions and help provide needed resources. Veterans can still serve their country and their community even after they've taken the uniform off. So here's a perfect example of how women vets have stepped out. They're building a home in a small community for a woman who needs a house. We're here to help them. We've been in that same situation. Um, our country really needs to realize the differences between the males and the female genders. And we know at Grace After Fire, if we get a hold of the female and we make her well, never underestimate the length she will go to to make the rest of her family well. These women are not broken. They may be bent and bloodied, but they are not broken. A veteran is known as a dependable, hardworking person with um, high work ethics. And so if we've had someone affected by trauma, it kind of changes what they were before they were affected by it. So if we bring that person whole again, an employer, a husband, a wife is going to have that whole person back. Helping the veteran doesn't just help the veteran, it helps his children who then grow up and contribute to the society, helps the veteran's parent, helps all those that come in contact with the veteran and wherever that veteran lives it fundamentally helps that community at large. Captain Hundreds, I was noting there are some definite consequences of not treating the veterans and the rest of the military family that needs services. Absolutely. We're finding more and more of our population in the National Guard has never deployed. And our suicide rate in the Army National Guard doubled from 2009 to 2010. So there were huge, drastic, tragic consequences for not getting assistance. And I wanted to point out that the National Guard has put in 
54 directors of psychological health in all our states and territories. We have yellow ribbon programs. We have transition assistance advisor programs. We have employer support. Tell me support. a little bit. Let's, let's go back and let's okay. talk about the yellow ribbon program, for yes. example. What is it uh, destined to do? The yellow ribbon program is a reserve component program we use in the National Guard that brings service members together at various points through the deployment process before they deploy and then at certain days after they deploy. And it allows them with their family members to come back and start talking about reintegrating into civilian life, which is very different. Anyone who's ever deployed, whether it's outside of the United States or even to a disaster here, is going to be affected by that deployment. And that will have an impact on the family. So yellow ribbon events are meant to bring them back tell them about what benefits they have, what's out there for them, and to really get eyes on individuals so they can follow up individually with that person about the program or the challenge that they might be dealing with. Mm. And some of the other programs you mentioned? Yes, there's an employer support for the Guard and Reserve. One of the things that the, the employer support, we call it ESGR, what they're doing now. What does now, that stand for, ESGR? Yes, employer support for the Guard and Reserve. What they're doing is they're surveying 80,000 employers. So we were talking about homelessness. What we're seeing is sometimes folks get deployed and they come back and they experience something called underdeployment. They were doing a rather menial job, then they took on a huge responsibility when they were in the service and deployed. Then they come back and that job isn't as meaningful to them anymore. So we have programs in place to help people to make sure that they're gainfully employed at a level that works for them, that provides some job satisfaction for them. Beyond the issue of employment and beyond the, the reintegration, um, I know that other agencies, and let's talk about SAMHSA, it has a strategic initiative specifically designated for military families. That's correct, that we do, and our administrator, uh, when she came on board a year ago, said this is a population that we need to pay attention to, even though there is really nothing in law and there's no appropriation that says we should become involved in this. But we had discovered, frankly, from our grantees, from our substance abuse and mental health grantees at the local level, that we did have individuals uh, who were coming into community-based agencies and seeking help. So the first thing we had to do is we had to recognize the fact that even the civilian agencies weren't asking people, do you have a DD-214? Have you ever served in the military? Have you ever been in combat? Can and you want to explain the DD-214? DD-214 is the piece of paper that the, you get from the Department of Defense when you, are, uh, when you go off active duty and you retire. And so the, the reality was that we needed to get the civilian providers thinking about this population and then directing them appropriately to VA facilities and to TRICARE and to DOD active duty facilities as appropriate. And then there are people who didn't want to go to those facilities or who needed care, and we saw them coming into our grantees through our family program, which was the issue about the family member is the one who's paying attention. So we have grantees in our systems of care program, which deal with children with emotional disturbances, and we were hearing that they were not getting care the way they wanted care in the community, either because they were far away from facilities. Mm -hmm. So our strategic initiative is to pay attention to this population and to emphasize it as a priority, to build the collaborations with the Department of Veterans Affairs, with the Department of Defense, with the National Guard Bureau, and to keep on collaborating um, until until we get to the point where we can show that every service member who's eligible and who needs service will get it no matter no matter where it may be and we want to see that happen in every community at the local level and at every state level so our initiative at SAMHSA is to get states to think about this in a broad way and then translate that into local community providers action and education and awareness and Dr. Carlin, the president also has an initiative. You want to talk a little bit about the presidential initiative on uh, issues related to military families? We've been very fortunate because Congress has recently enacted legislation that has broadened VA's authority to provide mental health and counseling services to family members. This has been um, a wonderful gift to the agency in so many ways because now we're able to work directly with family members in a way we haven't been able to do before. So within VA now, we are disseminating and implementing a variety of family counseling and couples counseling 
um, services. We're now able to work with family members to help them on certain emotional issues that they might be struggling with because we know if we help the family member, that will then help the, the veteran, the individual as well. And so we're now able to provide couples counseling to, uh, to couples, family counseling, and we're implementing throughout the veteran's healthcare system a variety of evidence-based, scientifically proven psychotherapies for couples and family members so that we can provide state-of-the-art care, not just to the individuals, but to the dyads, to the couples and the family systems. The VA was one of 16 departments that whose secretaries signed off on the president's report called Strengthening Military Families. And those 16 secretaries pledged that they would approach this population with the highest priority over the next few years. It's a very significant move. And that means that even organizations like NASA the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Justice, the Department of Education, all of those 16 cabinet level agencies have pledged to do something in the four areas of the report. And those four areas very briefly are increasing the psychological health of military service members and their family, that's the terms that, that is used in the report, strengthening child care education and um, military schools, strengthening opportunities for spousal employment, and making sure that um, all individual service members have access to services everywhere. I mean, it's a tremendous, tremendous report. And Hector, where the rubber meets the road, where you're dealing with the problems in the local area, do you see, you know, what are some of the needs that still remain to be filled? Obviously, we're hearing that there's all these new initiatives, mm -hmm. And what do you think is the top priority uh, in terms of the, the folks that you're dealing with? Well, all of this is very admirable. I'm glad that there are things beyond service, beyond active duty. Um, but everything begins during active duty time. Mm -hmm. So I also focus on making sure and, and, and just dialogue, even with the active duty uh, forces, because there are services there too. There's family advocacy, there's uh, the chaplain, system. There's all sorts of counseling for financial, personal. Those services are already in the active duty force. We need, or I would like to see that, continue to be ad advertised across every military installation and honed in because we need to try and attack or, or make the problem recognized earlier and do the best they, f they can prior to just... While they are deployed. Right. Or beyond. Once they come back, these programs... I'm sure there are some areas and some installations, depending on the leadership, the leadership plays a big role here. Mm -hmm. And, um, in, yes. In After the two yeah. years that we have had the psychological health program in the National Guard, we've seen over 5,000 individual service members. The number one concern is family and marital concerns. So for those that are mm -hmm. local to their communities and their families, they have to make that connection as Hector mentioned. It has to be connected back with the state, but the Guard Bureau and the states themselves have lots of programs in place mm -hmm. that mimic, are very similar to active duty as Hector mentioned. Sure. We use our chaplain corps, we use our medical people too. So not to forget that the Guard has program similar to active duty. And yeah. when we come back, we're going to be talking a little bit more about services and about supporting military families. We'll be right back. They tell me I was there, but I don't remember. I don't know where I really was. I do not know what I had for breakfast. I do not know who won the game. I don't recognize this man. If you or someone you know is struggling with a drug or alcohol problem, there is a solution. Recovery. Call 1-800-662-HELP for information and for hope. Through treatment, my life's a whole lot brighter now. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I was in the Army. I... Uh, for three years, I, um, I suffer from PTSD and depression. As a Marine, that's just something that I didn't 
feel comfortable doing. Uh, how do you go and say, uh, I think I'm losing my mind? I did seven years in the 82nd Airborne Division. I deployed to Afghanistan from 02 to 03, and then from that point on, I went to Iraq from 03 to 04. I joined the Army in 2000, um, active Army, um, and I deployed to Iraq. I was the first round deployment, so I left in January, right before the war started, and I was a truck driver, so was one of the first ones over the berm into Iraq. The Community Partnership of Southern Arizona is the Regional Behavioral Health Authority in, in Pima County. And one of the things that as an organization we're very much tuned into is kind of the changing needs in, in the community. I came to the VA about five years ago and I had worked in the community for, for many years and um, had worked with CPSA a lot when I worked at some of the public agencies. So I already had the relationships with a lot of the people there. And kind of once I came over here, I think that partly that we were having sort of a a surge in kind of more mental health funding coming into the VA. Um, there was just kind of more attention um, because of all the returning Iraqi vets. We believe that a system like ours can be of tremendous benefit uh, to organizations like TRICARE, the Department of Defense, in providing behavioral health benefits to enlisted uh, military and their families. And uh, in fact, have developed a proposal and have been working very closely with TRICARE and SAMHSA to try and move that forward. The two issues that you really see are peer support and in-home care. It is peer support because you must build a network of veterans. Now like they felt when they were in the service. You must have your, your brothers in arms, you must have your fellow service members standing beside you to, to overcome stigma, to get through this, and to feel that camaraderie that you once felt. And you must get in the home because pulling a veteran out of the home treating them and then putting them back in their home is treating a very small portion of the problem. We recognize that consumers in our system um, often would really be able to provide support to their peers, yet there really wasn't a mechanism to do that. We decided to start a recovery support institute to train and certify persons who had been through treatment in our system that then could come out as certified recovery support specialists and work at our providers and provide services. HOPE stands for Helping Ourselves Pursue Enrichment and we're a recovery, wellness, and reintegration center. We currently have a volunteer program which we have about 17 active veterans who are involved in our uh, program. There's several areas where we focus. We focus on life skills. We focus on behavioral health prevention and promotion. Uh, we focus on health and wellness. And we focus on pre-vocational support, um, all in a peer support model. And all with the idea that these will increase overall socialization and reintegration back into you know, what might be considered normal society. So you know, once a Marine, you're Always. Exactly, right? Creating that environment of trust, you know. Uh, when I was in the service, I, I was a squad, a squad leader and a team leader at a time. Um, and the one thing I could always do is sit down with, with my group, with my team, with my squad, take a knee and say, okay, what are the issues going on that we need to address in order for us to, you know, carry on? It's very similar to that, but we're dealing with emotional issues. In all reality, I think when you have someone you have a lot in common with, you just bond with them. You're more, it's more real and you're more willing to share with them because they understand where you come from. And these women, I think when I talk to them, I know exactly where they've been. I know where it's, you feel like there's no hope. You, you're trying to grasp what little bit you have. And, and for me to be able to be part of that and to help them get through that, that's just, that's part of my recovery. It's a community um, of people that are, that are all striving for recovery, to do better. Um, and it's a very uh, positive place. Veterans really want to give back and they have had successful treatment experiences and they feel that you know they have a lot to offer their fellow vets and I think that's something that's so fantastic about working with veterans. Well I had an individual come up to me matter of fact yesterday and said I'm glad you're here you understand what I'm saying 
Nobody else seems to take the time to listen to me completely. They pretend, they act like they're listening, but they don't. But here, everybody is concerned about my welfare. I find this very gratifying, that you don't find that very often. Just, I didn't know them before, but from just looking at them on the first day and watching what they do now, I can see my impact. And what I really didn't expect is I'm probably about an inch and a half taller now because I don't slump. I have a place. I'm making progress. I'm helping others. And it changed my life. And every day I work, I get home, and I feel better than I did when I went there. I'm going to have to be twins soon just to hold it all. Catherine, as we left off, you wanted to add a, f a few more comments. I did. I thought what Hector and uh, Captain Hunter said was very important. And the first thing that Hector mentioned was the issue about um, the active duty individual, the individual who comes into the military and has a military experience. And Joan talked about the fact that the National Guard has really recognized what that experience is, and the National Guard has really taken the leadership. I would challenge the other services to do what the National Guard has done because in reality, those of us who have served in the military and have been on active duty, we never talked about our emotional health. We never talked about psychological health. We were never skilled in resiliency training. And the fact that the military services are now paying attention to that is hugely important, but we have a very long way to go. So I think people need to understand in both the civilian and military communities that we have to encourage that the military should accept the fact that their emotional life is a part of their overall health and that in fact it is important to talk about those issues and those emotions and you can still wage war but you have to understand the emotional connection and I am actually very happy Hector that the services are beginning to do some of that and particularly that the National Guard is taking the lead on that. Is that your experience as well? Yes, I personally believe that uh, that some some progress has been made. Okay. It has to go across the board and it's very tough. We've been in a war for a long time right. and uh, sometimes it feels like catch up at certain points. Mm -hmm. But the important thing is that we're recognizing we're doing something, but it has to start immediately at that active duty level. As soon as they return, have things in place and while they're gone to take care of their families because they need to know that their loved ones are okay in the back and so forth. And Dr. Carlin, can the Department of Veterans Affairs weigh in on these issues that have just been mentioned? Well, we can, and we can do it most effectively in partnership with SAMHSA, with the Department of Defense, um, with the community. And one key issue that we've been talking around but haven't really centered on yet related to these discussions is stigma. Mm -hmm. And we know that there is a significant barrier that gets in the way of individuals getting the help they need. We now have treatments that work and work quite well, but individuals often don't get those treatments because of stigma, because of a psychological barrier um, that prevents individuals in many cases from getting the care that they need due to fear of reprisal, due to fear of emotion. perhaps emotion or not being able to seek gainful employment. Sometimes there's a perception, if I go seek help, then I might not be able to get the job I need or I might not be able to advance in my military career mm -hmm. the way I would like to. So it is so important that as um, not just within VA and not just within DOD or SAMHSA, but as, as a nation that we're talking more openly about mental health issues and supporting individuals, not overly supporting them in the extent that we are labeling individuals as having mental disorders when they don't as well. It's important to recognize that a lot of people come back um, from serving in the military that don't have mental disorders, but they might have some adjustment difficulties. They might have full-blown emotional disorders. So it's really important, no matter where they are in terms of their level of need, that individuals are identifying with them, meeting them kind of where they are, so to speak, and really engaging with them to try to figure out the the best place for them to get the help that they might need. But first, making that personal connection with a peer, with a family member, um, with one's physician, whoever that individual might be, it might be someone in the military, just making a personal connection and being open to talking about something's not just quite right and there's help available, but we need to get over the issue That's of stigma. It's still important in the National Guard. I think our younger generation is doing a better job of sharing their stories, but clearly 
we have put our directors of psychological health outside of the medical community because we didn't want or believe that someone would seek assistance from someone who was going to determine whether they were fit for duty. And we wanted to take that, that component away. Otherwise, we'd be forcing them underground, so to speak. And it's important, and I think because we put our directors of psychological health in places where yellow ribbon transition assistance is available, they become part of a larger team in the National Guard to support both our airmen and soldiers. A wonderful thing that the Department of Defense has done, I just want to acknowledge, is develop the Battle Minds program. Yes. And I would encourage individuals to check out this wonderful resource. The Battle Mind program is accessible through the internet. And it's individuals who served in military talking about their experiences, talking about their emotional difficulties, and what their stories were, and how they ultimately overcame the difficulties they were experiencing. And I think this issue about the confidentiality and career progression that people are worried about in terms of seeking behavioral health services is very real and has to be addressed directly by the leadership in the active duty ranks. And that means leadership from the squad or platoon level or company level or ship level all the way to the national level. And I see tremendous evidence that the upper echelon leadership is willing to say, we want to respect confidentiality, we want to respect career progression, we want you to seek, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said, it's a sign of a strong person if you seek help. And But that has to get through every single layer of the military. I was just going to say that, that, uh, that is absolutely correct. Every one, single layer. one thing is for you to listen to it in a room full of, right. you know, uh, the, the top brass, and then another thing is for the rank and file Absolutely. to be able to feel that comfort level. And how do we get to that comfort level? What can, what can be done at, at different levels of, of the military to really begin to, to make entryway into, well, into this whole stigma I, issue? I think it is the issue that we've sort of touched on directly, and that is this just discourse about mental and emotional well-being, Yvette. I think that the military has not been used to that. The more we can do that in natural, normal, developmental way. The civilian community does that sort of well, not well yet, but the military community and the military culture is learning how to do that. And I think that that is the base level awareness and understanding. Who, who teaches children how to talk about their emotions? I was never taught as, I was a military kid besides being a military officer. I lived in isolated bases all my life. I went to 16 different schools. Who ever taught me about sort of the emotional adjustment that is necessary? Now I had a strong family and that's what got us through it. But the reality is you have to name it. You have to be aware of it. You have to move it forward. And I'm very, very optimistic that that discourse is going on. Hector, I, I want to go back to you because in the substance use disorder community and the addiction side, the, the folks in recovery are telling their stories and it's creating such a momentum. Um, the folks that you counsel through your peer counseling program and coaching, are, is there that willingness for the members themselves and maybe using some of them, as, as you have noted, using some of the members themselves to carry that message? Mm -hmm. There is some of that. The willingness is obviously somebody who needs to have the willingness to go through this. That's where coaching comes in, which is to try and bring that willingness about the person. It's not giving direct advice or anything, but giving them a little bit of empowerment and, and, and know, hey, you know, and, uh, and build from the inside, okay, and this, this is what I'll do. For example, and I'll use the Navy, that's the last branch that I was in, they've also instituted something in that realm called Navy More through a contract that they have with the uh, Hazelden Foundation in Minnesota. And this is brand new. I just uh, heard about this recently where they can actually go online through, uh, through um, a way of signing on and talk to other folks that are actually suffering from uh, substance use and alcohol and that sort of thing which I thought was a great uh, tool to use, especially because when they're deployed, they have no other access to things at home, but they can do it uh, from the ships if, if available. You know, you just touched on something that's very important that we haven't talked about, which is health information technologies. As we're looking for new programs, as we're looking for uh, novel ways of, of getting the treatment or, or access to treatment, uh, we really do need to keep that in mind because I think that's gonna be uh, increasingly uh, available in the future and, and, and you may not have your traditional counselor that you speak to face to face. It's really going to be an interface with, you know, through 
uh, a computer that, that's going to be getting you the services. So I want folks to keep that in mind and hopefully we can flash an 800 number where people can get information. I want to go back to SAMHSA and I know that, that the military initiative is going to have some programs linked to it. I just want you to briefly mention them. Certainly. The uh, Strategic Initiative on Military Families is really embedded in our work in through our vehicles and our vehicles are what are known as requests for assistance or RFAs which reflect uh, competitions for grants and also through our contracts and what you'll see across SAMHSA's portfolio particularly in 2011 and going into 2012 um, we are embedding military families as a priority for those programs. So you'll see, for example, a jail diversion program. There will be a priority population for military families and veterans. Or you'll see uh, an access to recovery program, an ATR program. They have been one of our most profound proponents of pushing uh, a voucher program for substance abuse treatment. And so the ATR program is prioritizing this population. And you'll see that across the entire SAMHSA portfolio. Most importantly, for the first time, SAMHSA has actually put in um, a budget request for 2012. So it will be the first time we will ever have had money identified to um, do our policy academies for states. And that is uh, in our 2012 budget and we'll see what happens. But people should be looking out for all of SAMHSA's request for assistance, grant, and contract opportunities because they will all prioritize in some way, shape, or form military service members, veterans, and their families. For those people who may be in need of care, who may not be getting services uh, in the DOD facilities through TRICARE or through the VA. And we're getting to the end of our show, and I would be remiss not to mention National Recovery Month celebrated every September. We want to encourage everyone to go on the web page and to look at all the wonderful materials that we have and to encourage particularly military families to talk about their member uh, of the family that's been in the military and that's now in recovery from substance use disorders or mental illness. www.recoverymonth.gov. Thank you for being here. Great show. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click multimedia. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the Free Recovery Month Kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain your copy of this year's Recovery Month Kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.